In his insightful analysis, renowned investor Jeremy Grantham delves into the intricacies of market bubbles and their impact on various asset classes. With a keen eye for historical trends, Grantham explores the dynamics of stock markets, real estate, and bonds, highlighting the challenges and opportunities that arise during these tumultuous times. The beauty about indexing is you never miss an Amazon or an Apple. And the bad thing about indexing is you never miss having a lot of overpriced stocks into one of the relatively rare bubbles such as we have now. So it's kind of good news, bad news. If you can ride out the odd 50% decline, totally unnecessary, of course, on fundamentals 30 years ago. The market is mildly hysterical from time to time, and it's totally unjustified by the steady stream of dividends and earnings, but it happens. And if you want to ride those 50% drops, you know, good luck. It works out very well in the long, long run, but it can take you 20 years to get back in the game. If you get caught in 1929, it works out just fine, but you don't get your money back until 1955. (laughs) If you get hammered in 74, you don't get your money back until 87. And then when you've gotten it back for a month or two, you give it up again. And the same in 2000. By 2010, you're still losing money. So you have to be willing to ride out. And some people feel their lives aren't long enough to take the 10, 15, 20 year wipeout. So for those who feel they're brave enough and willing to try, I've always thought that sidestepping some of the pain might be a good idea. Jeremy Grantham offers a balanced viewpoint on indexing, acknowledging its advantages in capturing market growth, but also cautioning about the risks of overpriced stocks during market bubbles. He underscores the importance of enduring market downturns for long-term gains while acknowledging that some investors might find it challenging to navigate significant declines. Grantham's insights provide valuable guidance for investors seeking to balance the benefits and potential drawbacks of indexing in their investment strategy. I think they're perfectly straightforward. They're intellectually easy and psychologically disastrously difficult. They're easy because in most cases they're so extreme It's like, how do you notice the Himalayas when you're standing in northern India? I mean, they come out of the plane and they soar up. You can't miss these things. 1928, 29 was just such a massive rally. So the sheer price rise, you can't miss. Secondly, just to make it easier, the great bubbles have always tended to rise faster and faster towards the end. And that's a kind of defining feature also. And then thirdly, they have all been accompanied by massive public obvious crazy behavior where the headlines migrate from the financial page to the front page, where they migrate to the opening few sentences of the evening news on the radio or the television. And they talk about market new highs and they talk about what the Bitcoins of the era have done. I know it's not a stock, but it's a speculative instrument and the uh, game stops of the world. And back in 2000, most of you will be old enough to remember the pet dot coms and the utter craziness of that period. And the same was true of 1929. The same was true of Japan. We had a group from Solomon Brothers, a leading American brokerage house of the era who came around in uh, 88, 89, when Japan was moving to 60 times earnings and explaining that their yields, et cetera, and their interest rates, et cetera, they really should have been selling at 100 times and they were cheap and you should buy them. And it didn't stop the Japanese market breaking the following year. It has not recovered the high of 31 years ago yet. Jeremy Grantham astutely describes the dichotomy of market bubbles, evident in their extreme nature yet challenging to recognize due to psychological factors. His historical examples emphasize the recurring patterns of irrational behavior and sensationalism during such episodes. Grantham's insights offer a clear-eyed perspective on the dynamics of market bubbles, underlining their potential risks and behavioral challenges for investors. So uh, that was pretty painful taught us, in a sense, a powerful lesson about how human behavior works. But it also explained to us why the big firms couldn't play that game. It is simply not a commercial proposition to get out of a bull market. Because every now and then, they run further and faster than you expected. Japan went on and on and on, way beyond people's expectations. 2000 beat the record. There's a lot of difference between 35 times earnings and 21, the previous record. So sometimes they break out to an astonishing degree. Now, the bad news is that changes nothing. They go back even more and longer, and they go back where they came from. And the higher they go, the harder and longer they fall. But it changes everything when you're there. 
When you're having a bubble, it's really advisable to have the bubble be in one focused area. In 2000, for example, it was US growth stocks. It was not uh, global and real estate was really cheap as in cheaper than the cost of building the building uh, you could buy real estate for. The bonds were really cheap and inflation protected bonds had just come out and they yielded 4.2%, 4.3%. I mean, can you believe it? Real return guaranteed against inflation. Jeremy Grantham's observations reveal the complexities of market bubbles and the challenges they pose for both individual and institutional investors. His insights underscore the difficulty of timing exits during bullish periods and the concentrated nature of bubbles within specific sectors. Grantham's analysis provides a clear caution against overextension, emphasizing the need for a focused approach to investment decisions within the context of market bubbles. Within the market, the value stocks were not too bad and the small stocks were not too bad and small value was actually cheap enough that when the S&P had gone down 50%, it hadn't gone down at all. It was, I think, plus three. I mean, amazing. And the REITs, all of the real estate, they were up 30% as the S&P hit minus 50. That was a bubble that was paradise for an asset allocator because there were so many alternatives. What you want to avoid is what Japan did in 89. Japan had the biggest bubble in history, I believe, bigger than the South Sea bubble, and that was in land and real estate. And the old story, the land under the Empress Palace was worth more than the whole state of California. We spent two days actually asking and digging, and it was. It literally was. First of all, it's a big palace with great palace grounds. And secondly, downtown Tokyo, all around it, was selling for you know four or five, six times downtown Manhattan. And the numbers worked out, just amazing. Simultaneously, they had the biggest equity bubble of any important market. There are some flaky, tiny markets that don't count. But of any major market, that's the biggest bubble of all time. At the time, we were told it had gone 65 times earnings. There's always historical revisionism in the data, so you have to be a little careful. But at the time, it was clear everybody agreed 65 times earnings, which is pretty remarkable. And it had never sold at over 25 times before. So. That's the thing that makes every value manager wake up sweating in the middle of the night is Japanese stocks. Anyway, they managed to do both of these at the same time. And 31 years later, the land is not back, real estate is not back, and stocks are not back to where they were. This was a loss of perceived wealth so profound that you have to congratulate the Japanese for not going into a depression. And people talk about a lost decade, but that was a lost decade where they actually inched forward they actually did not go even backwards for the decade. When you're taking that kind of loss of wealth, you're in trouble. Now, in the so-called great financial crash, which irritates me as a title because I think it was a housing bust, the housing market had this perfect three sigma, one in hundred year outlier bubble. It had been very, very stable historically. So to get to that level, it only had to go up only, he says, about 40% or so in two to three years, which it did and then it gave it all back. But the trouble with 2007 housing bubble is it took the stock market with it. The stock market was not sensationally overpriced, but it was a big overpriced bull market. It was not in itself a bubble, but the housing market was a bubble, a beautiful, magnificent bubble. And if you look at it, it's perfectly round. It goes up for three years, it goes down for three years, exactly the same speed, and it goes all the way back where it came from. And the housing bubble inflicted about $10 trillion of loss of perceived value. So one minute you thought your house was worth 400,000, three years later, you were told it was worth 550,000. Three years later, you were told it was 400,000. And two years after that, 350,000. So you had lost an enormous asset. And housing markets are much more dangerous because more people own them. The middle class in particular, that owns very little stock, owns a lot of housing. And it really, when you lose that value, you skip the trip to Portugal and you realize you can't send your second son to uh, private school. And it really flows through the system. Don't do it. So what do we have this time? We have, of the four major asset classes on the planet, we have three and a half in bubble land. We have, Jim Grant would say, the most overpriced bond market and the lowest rates in the history of man that go back 4,000 years. There was never a time when so much had a negative return where you pay the government to take your money. So that's number one. Number two, we're a contender for the highest priced US equity market in history. I would say a majority of bubble experts think this is now slightly higher than 2000, which was epic. And some people do not, but at least we can all agree it's a contender. And then 
we have real estate. And real estate was kind of off screen until a few minutes ago. And suddenly, on some of the databases, it has risen 20% in the last 12 months. As Schiller's series, a little more conservative, lags quite a bit. I think it's only up 13, but the other series, perfectly seriously done. Up 20 is the sharpest rise, sharper than the 70s with inflation and sharper than the housing bubble of 2005. And what that means is metric we hero worship is multiple of family income. How much does the median house, the one in the middle, how many multiples of the median family income is? It's a nice, stable, fair metric. It used to be in America that we'd sell at three times family income. And in the bubble, we kind of went to four and a half or so and then back. And we are now at the multiple of family income that we were in 06, the very peak of the housing bubble. We're back. Now, the rates are very low, so all being well, you can, quote, afford it. What you can't afford to do if you're a beginner is buy it in the first place. How painful for most people high asset prices are. They're kind of fun when you own them. They're great for retirees who have nothing to do but liquidate their pile of assets. But for people who don't have it, and for society in general, it's a disaster. Because what has happened over the last 25 years is that the yield on assets has dropped as the price rose. And at 6%, you can reinvest and double your money in 12 years. And at 3 it takes 24 years. So in 48 years, you have a quarter of the wealth ignoring taxes for a second, uh, a quarter of the wealth that you would have had in the world on average of the 20th century. This is terrible. And the same with a house, you're getting half the house that you used to get for your income. It's a disaster for people who don't have assets. And the whole society is compounding as well, much more slowly. It's such a simple arithmetic point, but nobody seems to get it. It is slowing our wealth creation down and giving us the illusion that we're all getting rich. And of course, if you have a house, you know that the house hasn't changed. House was the same house at 300,000 as it was at 450 and back to 300,000. It's the same darned house. It doesn't hold off the rain any better in a housing bubble like today. It's the same with stocks, by the way. They're the same old stocks, only in stocks you get the fantasy of pretending that somehow their earnings have gone stratospheric and you can expand the storytelling to fit the available price. And that's why bubbles in the stock market are so dangerous. Jeremy Grantham's astute observations emphasize the delicate balance between market exuberance and rational caution. His examination of past bubbles and the current state of financial markets serves as a reminder of the importance of being attuned to market behavior, anticipating shifts, and making informed investment decisions to navigate the complex landscape of investment.